thanks for coming. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the future of Akka and um, kind of the the next upcoming cool things that's uh, gonna be in future versions of Akka. Um, just quickly before I start with the actual content, uh, my name is Johan Andrian. Uh, I work on the Akka team at Lightbend. Um, and I co-organized the Scala user group in Stockholm. How many of you have used Akka? Okay, it's a good, good ratio. How many of you have used it in production? No, it's the same people. It's amazing. Great. And the rest of you, have you like? Do you not know what it all is at all? How many have never have no clue about what Akka is? Okay, okay, good, thank you. So, um, Akka is a toolkit to build distributed and concurrent systems, um, and at its core is something called the actor model. And the actor model is goes back to the to the 70s and uh, research about concurrency and how to build systems. Um, It allows you to build message-driven systems um, on the JVM. So if you have heard about Erlang, for example, which is, I think, picking up a bit, um, what Akka allows you to do is basically what Erlang does, but on the JVM. Um, and it's a set of modules, so you might use one or two of them, or all of them, or depending on what problem you're solving. Um, so we have actors, which I just mentioned, and then we have uh, clustering, which allows actors to build a cluster system to scale it out over many servers. Uh, we have something called streams, which is a reactive streams implementation. Um, and we have persistence, which is CQRS and event sourcing for actors. And we have a fully asynchronous and streaming HTTP server in, in Akka HTTP. And we have something called Alpaca, which is uh, streaming connectors for different technologies. So something like Camel, but with asynchronous uh, reactive streaming. And all of these things, uh, we, we write them in Scala mostly, but all of them have full APIs in Java. So even if you're not interested in Scala, this might be really useful for you. So. Recently, we have been working on typed stuff. Um, I'm going to get back to that in a little while, what it means. But it means that a few things could be more type safe in the, in the current version of Akka. And we have made new APIs that are more type safe. So this talk is going to focus on two things, typed actors and then a little bit of streams. Uh, but let's start with the actors. So the core idea behind an actor is that you have a mailbox in which you put immutable messages. This is the only way to communicate with the actor. And the uh, toolkit, Akka, the actor system in Akka, makes sure so that your actor logic, it only processes a single message at any given time. So it manages scheduling this logic to process a message. Um, and this makes it possible then to write code which deals with concurrency, but without ever having to touch the concurrency primitives such as locks and synchronized blocks. So when an actor gets a message, it can uh, mutate its own state, including spawning a child actor. So the actors are actually forming a hierarchy um, it can send a message to another actor, or many messages to many other actors. Or it can change its behavior so that when it receives the next message, it can do something else. So let's say, for example, we're modeling a circuit breaker. Then this new behavior could be to not let messages through to a, an external service until some time has passed, and then we let through a single message, and we see if that is successful. And if it is successful, we close the circuit breaker and let the traffic through. Um, so the core actor thing is local. We have actors and they can send messages in between. Um, 
but this abstraction also really fits building distributed systems. So we could just as well split this application into two parts where we have different nodes, different JVMs, different actor systems, which still communicate through messages. So the abstraction is the same, even if, even if the, uh, the risk that a message gets lost because of network in between, for example, is much higher, of course. And you will have to think about serializing the data into bytes because you have an object and you want to put it over the wire and it needs to go to bytes and then back to an object on the other side. So the basic API, the classic actors, looks like this. This is Scala code. I hope you can follow it even if you haven't um, written any Scala or learned Scala. Um, so we have a single method that we need to implement, the receive method. And it will get any message sent to the actor and it can react on them like this. Right? So what is the problem with this? Well, any here is essentially the same as object in Java. So this means that even if I have a very strict protocol for my actor, which messages it actually accepts, it's impossible to describe this through the type system. So whenever someone else has a reference to my actor, they can send whatever to it. Many people, they react on this when they look at actors the first time and they go like, oh my god, I lose the type system, what is this? Then I can just as well do JavaScript. Um, but I would say that having worked with, with actors in the ACA team now for three years almost, and before that consulting around ACA for a couple of years, uh, it's quite uncommon that you actually send the wrong thing to an actor because you will have tests, you will, you will notice it quite early, right? So what is actually helped by having something more type safe around this is to discover how things are interconnected in a new code base that you haven't seen before, right? Or just that someone else in your team wrote. Um, and of course, it fails earlier rather than later. So you save some time, you have shorter, shorter kind of iterations where you see that you did something wrong. So I would say that it helps productivity and of course it makes more reliable systems because you know that it's not wrong. Um, so making the actors typed is kind of a complicated matter. Uh, there are a few research papers on it. Uh, we haven't really gone with any of those research papers, like their, their specific solution to it, but we have definitely looked into them and kind of been inspired by them in, in where we landed. So let's take a look at these typed actors in Akatype. And I'm going to do this with a, with a sample. So we're building our own burglar alarm uh, to save money because time doesn't cost anything. And our list of requirements is that we need to be able to enable and disable our alarm with a pin code, right? Because we don't want the kids to enable the alarm by mistake and then we have to pay uh, the security company for sending people. Uh, and we also don't want uh, the burglars to be able to turn off the alarm when they break into our home. Um, and then we want to have sensors that tell our uh, alarm that there was some activity in our house, the window was open or broken or someone is walking in the living room. So we want to accept notification about activity. And if there is an activity and the alarm is enabled, then we want to sound the alarm. Okay, fairly simple use case. So we're going to start with defining the protocol of our actor. Um, Trait in Scala is pretty much the same as an interface in Java. So we're using this trait alarm message as a marker interface. So we're making three different kinds of events, messages we can send, but all of them implements this marker, marker interface, right? And we have enable alarm with a pin code, and we have disable alarm with a pin code, and then we have the activity. Right, so those three use cases. 
Then we define um, a behavior. So behavior is something that is typed with what kind of message that it accepts. And we do this by using one, of, one out of a few factories. So receive is a factory that takes a, a Lambda expression. I think there's a builder also on the Java side of the API. Um, but, I, but I'm pretty sure you can do the same in the, in the Java API with a, with a Lambda as well. So whenever there's a message to this actor, uh, we get a call to this function. Um, and as parameters for this call, we get an actor context, which lets us interact with the actor system, the surrounding kind of um, utilities, and we get the actual message. So in this case, we look at this message, and if it is an activity event, then we sound the alarm. Uh, and what we return is the next behavior for the next message. So in this case, we're saying, stay in the same behavior. Don't change behavior, because I sounded the alarm, but there's no reason to not sound the alarm again if there's more activity. Um, or we have someone entering the code, and actually also the, the right code. And then we're going to disable the alarm, and then we're going to change the behavior. So we're calling this method down here which is the dis disabled alarm behavior. And in this case, we ignore pretty much any message except for enable alarm, if someone enables the alarm with the right code. OK? So this looks a bit like something recursive, because we're calling something from something else, and vice versa. But uh, in reality, we're reacting to a single message and we're returning a behavior. And then someone else will, the actor system will invoke the function, the new behavior with the next message, if there is one. OK? So then actually running this, we create an actor system. And as the root actor, we call our enabled actor behavior. And we get a system back. And this system is also an actor ref, and an actor ref is what you use to interact with an actor from the outside. So just to be very clear about this, the system is also an actor ref to its root actor. Uh, and then we can send messages to it. On the Java side, this uh, bang exclamation mark, it's called tell. So there's a dot tell method as well. In Scala, we often use this exclamation mark to send messages. And this allows us to send all the possible messages, but if we send uh, the wrong kind of message, we get a compiler error. So this, what this bang or tell accepts is dictated by this type parameter, okay? which in turn is dictated by the type of messages that the behavior we created it with accepts. Um, so if we compare like the old untyped actors with, uh, with the new typed actors, then in the untyped actors, we have this uh, magic method called sender. And as a reaction to any message we get, we can call sender to get who sent the message to send messages back. Right? Um, but this can't be expressed the same way with types, because the same uh, incoming message could be sent from different receiving actors. Right? And they might or might not able to accept the same kind of response message. So on the typed side, you have to encode the recipient in the message. Right? And since you encode this, who will receive a response, you also encode what kind of response you accept. So you will get a compiler error if the response would be of the wrong type. Uh, and of course, you might have cases where you don't want to have a response. You have a fire and forget. You don't have a request response interaction with an actor. And in the old untyped actors, any message can be sent to any actor. As I said, not very common that it happens, but it can happen. And on the typed side, we have this type parameter which dictates who, what you can send. And also in the old um, API, then an actor only side effects. 
So it can also change behavior, but it does so by calling some imperative method. While in the new API, uh, whenever you act on a message, you also return what's going to be the new behavior, which may then be the same, or it may be that you want to stop, or it might be that you want to uh, change to a different behavior. Okay. So, like one of the core strengths of Akka is this that I mentioned before that we can go from from local to distributed with basically the same uh, abstractions. We don't have to change our code for it. It's true to some extent because of what I mentioned before with the bigger risk of message getting lost. So inside of a JVM, it's very unlikely that a message gets lost, but sending it over a network, there is so many things that can go wrong, right? Just, um, ops guys, they uh, stepped on a cable in the server room and poured coffee in the switch. Um, so let's look at how this would work then with typed and cluster. So we're gonna up the game a bit and make our burglar alarm distributed. So now we add the requirements that we can have any number of nodes or servers in our home. Uh, and on any of those nodes, we can have sensor that will contribute with events that something happened, right? So we will have, uh, I don't know, a Raspberry Pi in every window with the sensors attached or So the main tool to do this is something called the receptionist. So with the uh, typed actor system, uh, there is always this receptionist actor that you can interact with. And the receptionist, you can register an actor of a specific type with a key that it ty is typed with the same, like with the protocol of the actor. And on any node, you can also subscribe to a key to get uh, new service implementations, new actors that fulfill this protocol sent to you whenever they are registered. And you will also get a message when they are removed, if they die or if they stop. Okay. So we start with defining um, a key. So in this case, we had the alarm message, which was the protocol of our actor, and we give it a unique ID also because just the type of message that it accepts isn't kind of how you could imagine that you had four different actors that all had the same protocol, but they do different things with the same messages, right? So in this case, we, we name it alarm. And then before we start the alarm, just the code that we saw, saw before, we, we do a little setup. So this factory setup is something that gets run before the actual uh, actor starts, or actually when when the actor starts. So not it's not waiting until you get a message, but as soon as the actor starts, we do some setup that we want to do. Uh, and in this setup, we send a message to this receptionist, where we register with the key and this actor itself. And then it also optionally sends a response back when it has seen the registration. And as soon as we have done that, we just switch over to this enabled mode that we saw before. Right? So what we do here is that we publish that uh, this is an actor that can receive these messages. And then on the other side, uh, we, have defined, we are defining a sensor now. So we have a sensor, and it only accepts a single kind of message right now, which is that the window was opened. You have to start somewhere. Um, and then in the sensor behavior, we um, subscribe, we keep a set of the alarms that are in the system. So in this case, we have only one likely, but you could imagine that there would be an alarm on every node and we wanted to send events to all of them. And then we send a subscribe message to this receptionist, the same key. And then we send ourselves as the actor F to send uh, subscription changes to. Okay, so whenever, let's say we started this node first, when we subscribe, there will be a, an empty list of actors that are alarms. 
But then in a little while, we start the node with the actual alarm on, and it, and it register itself, and this actor will get a message that now there is a list of a single actor f that can accept the alarm messages. Um, and then whenever we get the listing, we just update our own list of alarms and we stay with the same behavior. And when we get a window opened event from the actual hardware sensor, we go through this list of alarms. And for every alarm, we send it an activity event. Right, so we trigger, trigger the sensor. There's, some few, there's a few tricks in here that I didn't touch, but just kind of the main, the general principle of it. Um, and then we run it. So here I'm like constructing a cluster inside of a single JVM, which isn't what you would do in an actual system, but just to show. Uh, so I'm starting two actor systems, one with the alarm and one with the sensor behavior. And then I do a pro programmatic forming of a cluster. So I, uh, for the first node, I make it join itself. And for the second node, I make it join the first node. And this forms a cluster. So this can, can also be done by configuration and all kinds of ways. But this is nice because it fits in a slide. Uh, and then a day later, I trigger the window opened event. And this will then reach the sensor on the node, and that will trigger the alarm on the other node. Right. So that was kind of the first uh, first session of, of this talk, because it's like a two talk in one. You get two talks for the price of one. Um, and the other part is something called stream refs. Um, did any of you use Akka Streams? R3, OK. Good, good. I kind of had a feeling. So I'm going to start with a bit of stream fundamentals. So stream is something we have built on top of actors to um, solve this very common use case that you want to deal with potentially infinite st sized streams of elements. So you want to do some processing. It comes from JMS or Kafka. Or a really large uh, file on disk. And in the other end, you want to have some other technology. In the middle, you want to transform a bit and maybe filter a little bit and, and all that. And if you have heard about um, reactive streams, any, any anyone heard about reactive streams? Uh, it's like two, three, four, or five. Um, so it's um, a few of the members of my team, together with some people from, from Netflix and Twitter, I want to say, um, probably Pivotal as well, uh, went, got together and, and decided that there needs to be this interop uh, API for asynchronous streaming libraries so that we can use the libraries uh, with each other, even though they, they implement it in different ways. Uh, and this became a part of the standard library in JDK 9. So there is some standard APIs in it um, that specifies how this is supposed to work. And there's also a TCK where you can, if you're implementing a library like this, you can test it and see that you fulfill the requirements of the, of the standard. So Akka Streams is one of those. And it solves the following problem. You have a, a source of elements, uh, ROMBs, I think it's called. And then you have some transformation, and then you get this uh, pentagons in the other end, and then in the far end you have something consuming them, right? So you're creating elements, you're transforming them, and you're emitting them somewhere. Potentially, uh, with this standard, you can have asynchronous boundaries in between these. So it means that they can run concurrently. But since they run concurrently, there is this tricksy problem, because if you pass something over to, to another thread, you don't know if it really had time to do that, or if it's filling up. or So the problem that Reactive Streams is solving is that to make sure that we don't fill something up or break stuff, we do back pressure. Whoops. We do back pressure. So the consumer on the far end will dictate how far the producer, 
how fast the producer can produce elements. So if the sync in this case can only pr uh, accept a single message per second because it's, I don't know, writing to disk, then we want that throughput to propagate backwards through the stream so that the source, even if the source could potentially be must much, much faster, doesn't produce elements faster than it needs to, right? So a good example of this would be you have a browser client and the browser client does a request and as a response to that request you want to send back results from a database, right? But there isn't really any reason to read this really fast from the database if the connection is really slow to the client, right? And usually you would do some kind of paging, but imagine if you could just, you know, feed the data as long as the client wants in a pace that the client can deal with. So this allows for that. For example, like HTTP, you could stream rows from a database uh, without paging. Okay, so the new feature, this already existed since a long, long time ago, but this is the new thing uh, where if you have an ACA cluster, um, you can create a stream on one node and you feed it to a special sync and when you run it, you get a source ref back. And this source ref you can send across the network to another node. And on that other node, you can use this as a source for a stream. So you could have like an end-to-end -end thing where a consuming node controls the speed of the elements that are produced on the sending side. Let's take a look at how that looks in code. So we have a, now I'm back to the old untyped actor API, by the way. So we have an actor, and when it gets the message, send me numbers, it runs this number source, which is basically a source of the numbers from one to 100,000. Into this stream refs dot source ref, so that's the factory to create a source ref, and when we run it, we get a future source ref. So this is uh, corresponds to a completable future in Java. On the, the Java API, it is actually a completable future you get back uh, with a source ref, and when that source ref arrives, we transform it into a send me numbers reply with the ref, and then we send that to whoever sent us the message, right? So some other actor sends us this send me numbers, and we create the stream, and we get the source ref back, and then we pass the source ref to the other actor. And on the other side, here we have the actor who actually asked for the numbers. So when it starts up, it sends the send me numbers message, then at some point it gets the send me numbers reply with this source ref. And it runs the source ref with a simple for each sync here. So the speed of this for each will probably be very high, but imagine that it was slow. Or we put some kind of a flow control stage in here. So we could, for example, use throttle, which is a built-in one, where we would say uh, throttle this stream to only do one message per second. And this would all feed back then across the network to the other node and make sure that it doesn't produce more than, more than one element per, per second. Um, so this is by design not something that is meant to compete with like Spark or Flink or you know something where you write a stream processing pipeline and you deploy it into a big cloud and or a big big cluster and it automatically you know distributes it but it's, it's a, a bit lower level. So yourself, you will be in charge of where things are run and who will be streaming to who and all that. But it's ideal to combine with the alpaca stuff I mentioned earlier and doing some kind of feeding data between actor systems in a cluster. Um, yeah, so we spend a lot of time on documentation in the ACA team. So we have the section for typed, 
which is still experimental, but we hope to make it make a final release soonish to not promise anything. Uh, and the stream refs, they are already released, I think, in their final form. Um, so read about those in the docs. Uh, we have a new forum for ACA, which is under discuss.aka.io, where you can go and ask questions when you try this out and it didn't work, uh, or just discuss things around ACA. We also have a, some kind of a developer resource place where you can find examples and more complete tutorials and guides around, around ACA and play and log them and Scala to some extent. Okay, I really sped through this talk because I ran out of slides now. Sorry, I hope I didn't really speed through the code samples too much. So, um, thanks for listening. And do you have any questions? I need 20 minutes of questions now. <laughs> yeah? So the question was, is there some way to provide your own logic for back pressuring, B but also about actors? So actors per se don't do any kind of back pressure. Um, if you use the default uh, Aka streams. So with streams, um, no, you cannot because you either have a consuming end that can consume at, at the rate that you're producing, or you don't. So you should never have to even consider providing a custom thing for it. Maybe I misunderstood the question. Well, I mean, like, uh, we have a spike to many objects somewhere. Uh, there is, like, there is a source of data. We have many objects there, and just there is a spike, and there is something that processes all these objects and other things, and that thing just Okay, so you, so you have a spike and that causes you to create m too many streams rather than one stream that produces too fast. Yeah. And the processor just can't keep up with the rate. Yeah, so this is the thing with with, yeah. with ACA streams and reactive streams per se. Or like it is that if the processor can't keep up, that was, will also result in back pressure. So that will also propagate back then across the network to the producing side and stopping it from producing more than you can actually get to move through the system. Right? Yeah, or the producer isn't, uh, isn't actually allowed to produce more than the downstream can consume. So, right? so if you have something where you cannot do back pressure, let's imagine you have an HTTP endpoint and you have someone else, you're not in control, and they're pushing in data. right? Um, so then you would either have to stop accepting requests because you're overloaded to protect your own system, right? try again a bit later. Um, or you would have to throttle them as well so that the speed that they produce data is slower than they could potentially because you have a slower processing downstream. Did that help? Uh, what do I think about the micro-profile thing, reactive streams? So this is the, a few of operations that 
would be coming with the JDK out of the box, right? Oh, this is a different thing? Yeah, I think there's a, a micro profile uh, with sort of JDE. Ah, to, to allow the, um, like the servlet API to stream stuff using reactive streams and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not read up on it, but I think it's a great idea. Uh, because it's a typical place where you have this problem, right? Like you would want to make either consumers um, protected from fast producers or also, when you when you pull data from a from a servlet, for example, and you you're fetching that data from another system, then this is a really nice thing that you won't be pushing filling up filling up some buffer unless you need to, right? Um, so I think that is promising, at least. Yeah. Any more questions? So if, if the messages between a stream ref uh, gets lost, for example, that will simply fail the stream. So there is no redelivery implemented or anything like that. So that you would have to build on top, basically. Uh, we haven't really discussed it. Uh, there might be, it might be possible with the building blocks that are already in Aka streams, right? So you have uh, the uh, retry flow, for example, which will restart the flow whenever it fails. But in this case, you would also have to include that in, in some kind of messaging protocol with the remote actor, right? Because, so we'll fail on both sides if it fails, meaning that both the sending place and the receiving place would be have to be aware that there will be a new stream coming. Or, um, yeah, nothing, nothing crystal clear, but yeah. Um, so, sort of general question: uh, uh, No one's got a particular one. How is Scala doing when compared to Kotlin and Clojure and other VM languages? Do you see the increasing uh, over time? So, yeah, so. It is definitely increasing, but it's not having the kind of hype that Kotlin is having right now. So that, those days are all, all over for, for Scala, and it's more of a kind of bread and butter language, I would say. So um, we, we see growth, and we see some big companies using it, but we don't see this kind of excited attention so much anymore. So if you go to pretty much any Java conference, there will be a Kotlin talk right now, right? So I think those days for Scala were five years ago. Um, compared to Clojure, I think Clojure is interesting, but it's, it has nowhere near the kind of market share of, I think, neither Kotlin nor Scala. Um, I think it's, I'm not sure why, actually. It's pretty neat. Was, was that an answer? Yep. And new systems appearing all the time. And I was just interested in insight into how all the light bend uh, software, because you can, you can get your stuff for free as well, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. It's all both Akka, Logom, Play, and Scala is, is free, free and open source. Yeah. Um, we're, we're collaborating with IBM actually to kind of make the next. Maybe thing after WebSphere, I'm not sure. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at all the attention Reactive has gotten recently, there is also at least a few talks on every conference and uh, kind of sneaking its way into Java E, definitely inside of Spring with the Reactive Spring, Spring stuff. Uh, So, so the question, sorry, I was bad at repeating questions now, but uh, so the question now was, do you need to be 
s slightly smarter to work? Was that about Scala or was it about reactive? So, so I think a lot of that is experience because you have read a lot of Java. I'm just kind of guessing, um, and much of the complexity in Java is hidden behind annotations, which you may or may not have a clue what they actually do because it might happen in runtime through runtime viewing, while in Scala the like the move is to do this explicitly rather. Right, so you have actual code that does it. You never do runtime weaving like that. So this might be a bit intimidating to s when you start out to understand the abstractions that allows this, especially like the functional stuff. But but I also think that now that Java is moving in that direction, it might, the the kind of threshold to understand it is less. It becomes much smaller. Uh, I don't think that you have to be smarter to do it, but it requires an effort to, to learn the language, definitely. So if you compare it to Kotlin, I think Kotlin is more of a uh, less powerful, but easier to get into. So that's the balance that they have s struck somehow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So with the um, typed actors, can an actor only process a single type of message? So I mean anything that you can express with a type hierarchy, right? So you have a super type, you have an interface, and you have any number of implementations of that interface. That's how you can limit it. But you cannot accept um, heterogeneous types, like combine two different protocols into one actor, without doing a few tricks, right? But you can also always fall back to making an actor that accepts object, and you can still send it any object in the entire JVM, right? It's not a good idea, but... So the context would be like uh, dependencies and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then you would probably model that with the protocol, right? So you would have an actor that accepts the, the usual message, which is its normal kind of processing thing, and then it also has a different message, which is like update the context. This is the new version of the data that you need to check against. or. Yeah, so it's still the protocol of the actor. You shouldn't define it anywhere else. It should be defined together with the actor. And there you have the control to make a common super type for those two messages. Um, yeah. So the question is, will this actor accept also poison pill? In ACA untyped, there is a special kind of system message called poison pill, which kills an actor. You can send it to any actor, and it will kill itself. No, it doesn't. So the actor would have to have its own message that tells it to stop. And I think this is actually a good thing. And if you look at kind of best practices with untyped actors, you should probably also have this as an explicit part of the protocol rather than randomly killing actors, right? Uh, but they are still organized in hierarchies. So if the parent actor stops, all the children will be stopped, right? So that is like one aspect that's still the same. Yeah? Um, does it supersede FSM? Does it supersede FSM? Yes, I think it does. I don't think we will need the FSM abstraction anymore because this is so much closer to it already. It's really nice how it can express stateful, uh, finite stateful machines. 
Ja. So, is there any tools to express uh, like, 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 um, like formal methods, like a, f a formal description of well, not the pro not the actual interactions, but the states? So, so Roland, who who was uh, team lead in the ACA team up until a year ago, maybe um, he he has some Scala tool where you use the type system to describe transitions and interactions in a more kind of f formal way and you can check that this sound using the type system uh, that is to, to me that is kind of far out it's it's really cool but it's not something I would kind of recommend that you jump into uh, it does a lot of type system tricks on Scala in Scala to be able to do this in a declarative way so it's kind of the deep end of the pool Okay, thank you for asking a lot of questions and filling, filling more of my time. Feel free to come talk to me afterwards if you have any, any more questions. <laughs>